Okay, so this video is looking at amines. Um, so this is a post-AS uh, topic, um, but we have met amines before um, when we did haloalkanes or halogenoalkanes um, because one of the reactions, one of the nucleophilic substitution reactions uh, we did with um, haloalkanes was with ammonia and the product of that reaction um, was um, would have been a amine. So amines are, are compounds um, which are based around ammonia. So uh, I think it's a very useful thing um, to remember is that what we're talking about when we're talking about amines, certainly in terms of um, reactivity or reactions, um, is that we're essentially talking about ammonia, but in which one or more of the hydrogens of ammonia have been replaced by an alkyl or aryl um, group. So, but in terms of any mechanism that we do, any reaction that we do, we can still think about uh, what would happen if it was ammonia um, we just may have to tweak it very slightly obviously the products the naming of the product would be different um, and then maybe a couple of other um, reactions would be slightly different but essentially um, if you can remember how how things happen with ammonia you can pretty much remember how things would happen with an, um, with most amines um, so there are a couple of examples um, here um, so we've got um, methylamine in which um, essentially one of the hydrogens of ammonia is now a methyl group. Um, we'll talk about uh, those that word aliphatic um, shortly. And then we've got ethylamine, so one of the hydrogens have been replaced by an ethyl group. And then uh, we've got um, finally at the bottom right there phenylamine. Um, so we we haven't in our in our studying so far, we haven't done um, the aromatic chemistry yet, um, and that aromatic chemistry uh, would have been looking at um, a, a group called the benzene group, um, and so we are not yet familiar with uh, this structure here, but um, it doesn't really, uh, it, it, there's only really going to be one tiny part um, of this video that is going to really rely on some knowledge of uh, that structure, and I think we'll be able to cover it and approach it um, satisfactorily. Um, and then, of course, when we do aromatic chemistry, uh, it'll, it'll make even more sense. Um, but we'll also talk about the distinction between aliphatic and aromatic um, in a little while as well. So just as we've done before, um, particularly with alcohols, um, that was uh, um, a series where we paid particular attention to whether we, they could be classed as primary, secondary or tertiary. Uh, we can do the same with amines. So um, with uh, the alcohols, we were talking about uh, how many carbons were attached to the carbon that the uh, hydroxyl group was attached to. And here we're talking about how many alkyl groups are attached to the nitrogen. Um, so with ammonia, we have just three hydrogens. Uh, with a primary amine, um, one of those hydrogens has been replaced by um, some sort of by an alkyl group or a or an aromatic group. So a primary amine is going to have uh, one carbon bonded to the nitrogen. Secondary is going to have two carbons bonded to the nitrogen. Tertiary is going to have three, and then we've got this um, fourth thing, which isn't an amine, but features uh, in this topic. Um, it's called a quaternary ammonium salt, um, and it's a, it's 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 the same principle as when we've done ammonium. Um, so when we've done NH4+, plus, um, the lone pair has formed a dated bond um, with a H plus ion, and we get now a, that structure NH4+. Plus. Well, we've got something um, very similar here. Uh, we've just replaced those hydrogens uh, with alkyl groups or, or an aromatic group. So we've, got our, we've still got an ammonium ion as such, but we call it a quaternary ammonium ion because um, we're making it clear that these are alkyl groups that are attached to the nitrogen as opposed to uh, hydrogens. So it, it's going to be important, it's going to be useful, this classification primary, secondary, um, tertiary and quaternary, but it's really going to be relevant to when we're looking at the products of certain reactions when we are making um, certain amines and it's also going to be, it's going to matter when we look at um, the basicity of amines as well. So we're going to look at nomenclature and naming, and I have to say, um, it, it's a it's it's not perfectly clear. Um, it's not a hundred percent clear. Maybe that's a better better way of doing it. It's not going to be a problem, but it's not a hundred percent clear when it comes to AQA uh, because they are a little bit inconsistent uh, in the way that they approach names. Although it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be a problem because in um, nearly all instances 
um, the names that you get to do with amines are going to be in questions. So really what you have to be able to do is decode those names to understand what the name means. Um, as far as I can tell, and I may have missed, I may have missed one, but looking through all of the exam questions that have been in the current specification, um, and so that's quite a few um, potential papers, and there's only been one occasion where you've had to actually name uh, an amine. So uh, you can see here we've got uh, a sort of a UPAC approach, and we've got something called a common name. Uh, I think there's a slight mistake on the second one. It says tert butylamine. Well, it, it, if we were naming it, um, certainly in terms of if we had to do that, we would call that tetra. Okay, because of the four. Um, so one of the things that sort of the reason I'm showing you both of these is not that this is help. This only slightly helps us with going about what we need to do. It's just to recognise that when we look at nomenclature now, we're going to see versions which we could say were UPAC versions, and we're going to see versions which we could say were common name versions. And um, and AQA, to be honest, um, use a mixture of the two. Um, so it's not going to be a problem, but it's just to sort of recognise that actually this is one area where the AQA, certainly the questions or the examples that they have do sometimes deviate from what we would consider to be um, the sort of actual UPAC approach. So in many instances, uh, amine is going to be at the end um, of the name of the compound, so it's a, it's a suffix. And in many of the versions that appear um, in any exam papers or, or, or whatever in the AQA stuff, um, they're normally just focusing, the names are just focusing on what groups are attached to the nitrogen. Uh, and so we saw it a little bit, we got a sense of it earlier when we talked about methylamine and ethylamine. Um, so we got this example here, methylamine. And if we have uh, if we have more than one group and they're the same, then we're going to do what we've done before. Um, we're going to use the, um, we're going to say have di in front of it or tri in front of it or tetra. So um, we've got example here. We've just got trimethylamine. So that would be a, um, a nitrogen uh, that had uh, three methyl groups attached to it. Okay, so that would be trimethylamine. Just put the lone pair to remind us it's there already. Um, and it is possible for there to be uh, an amine where it's not just the same type of alkyl group attached. And this sometimes does feature, um, it's never featured in you having to give an answer, but it has featured in terms of um, what's been given in an actual question. Um, so we could have something, uh, for example, uh, where we have a nitrogen uh, which has got a hydrogen attached to it, but say has a methyl group and has uh, a propyl group attached to it. Oh, that's space there, sorry about that. And that's why we've got that example at the bottom there of methyl propylamine. So they, like I say, in the vast majority of the time, as far as I, it's, well, based on what I've done trying to go through all the papers, um, amines in terms of names, uh, in terms of using names, is quite often been there in the question. And so you have to be able to decode the name in the question, but actually in, there's only been one occasion that I've found where you've actually had to name something. But I think it helps, um, knowing these uh, the way this name works, I think helps when you have questions where maybe you're trying to work out how many different isomers perhaps there are, and you know that you've got a nitrogen, for example, in the formula, so you can think about the different ways uh, the different uh, the different lengths of alkyl groups that you could play with perhaps when you're trying to work out what isomers um, maybe a, a molecular formula has. Um, it can also be used as a prefix. We can, I sorry, identify an amine using a prefix, so we use the word amino. Um, that's going to feature absolutely when we do amino acids, um, but on that occasion we're talking about um, a compound with two functional groups, an, an amine group, that's the amino, and a carboxylic acid group, that's the acid part of it. So um, I'm sort of going to treat those separately because we will always think of those as amino acids. Uh, but you can, um, again, these are examples from, um, these are particular names that have been used in exam questions. Um, so one amino um, propane, and we can basically see, um, and that one is actually important um, because we could have the amine group perhaps in the on the second carbon and in which case we would call that two amino propane 
And then we've got a diamino hexane, the one and the six are important because it's making it clear that the uh, amine groups are at the end of both ends, well, either end of the, both ends of the chain, sorry. So they're at both ends of the chain. So those numbers are important. So again, um, these are, you know, things that you would have to decode as opposed to maybe generate in the first place. So as long as you, you know, they, they do follow, they do follow our rules. They do follow, you know, the fact it's one, six and di tells us we've got two. Amino tells us an amine group and then hexane tells us um, it's a six carbon chain and the one in six tells us whereabouts on the carbon chain those um, amino groups or amine groups are. So like I was saying about um, AQA, I mean, if we're thinking about those, we, you know, whether pre prefix, suffix, whatever, um, it's probably, it pro I think it helps. I mean, I, I have to admit, I had a certain element of uh, uncertainty myself as to what it was they ac actually really wanted because it's not really very clear. It's, the specification doesn't really spell it out. Um, and even in the mock scheme instructions, uh, the only real example they have is they say amine ethane, they're saying is wrong. Uh, and that's fine because that doesn't fit either of those two, the prefix or suffix we just looked at. Um, but then they say it should be ethylamine. Uh, and then they have in brackets, although amino ethane can, can gain credit. And yet, when we look at some of those uh, examples on the previous slide, they have used, uh, they didn't call it propylamine. There was one of them they didn't call propylamine, uh, although they probably more commonly would. Um, they called it uh, one amino propane. So... When I, I then looked further, you know, into the papers, you can see there's a range of examples that have been used in questions. Um, uh, that's quite useful to look at. I'll just come, I'll I'll talk about the four amino phenol in a second. Um, but there, so it's been used a lot. Amines have appeared. The names of amines have appeared quite a lot in questions. And I think based on those previous couple of slides, you could decode what the structures or of all of those names would, or what structures those names would refer to there's, and there's only to the best of my knowledge at the moment I might have missed something there's only been one question where you've had to give an answer and that curiously was three amino pentane um, so it wasn't like a, a methylamine or an ethylamine <clears throat> now I think what tells us that that's the approach what would have told us that was the approach we needed to take when naming the compound would have been the fact that the amine group wouldn't have been at the end of a chain. So if it's an, at the end of a chain, just simply go with the methylamine or the propylamine or ethylamine or whatever. But if the amino group is somewhere along the chain, somewhere in the middle, somewhere that's not the end, then I think you've got to think about um, using the prefix amino and using a number to show where exactly uh, that amino group is. So the four amino phenol as a word, as a name, has appeared twice, um, but in both occasions it's been about um, doing a mechanism, and in both occasions they have represented and, and said that you are to represent it as RNH2, and then you've had to do a mechanism using RNH2, and then you've done things like, you know, you would have done the arrows or whatever. So the fact it's called for amino phenol, you've got to try not to let that confuse you because in AQA we don't do phenol. But um, to be fair to AQA, they're at least saying, well, look, just, just use R to represent the sort of phenol group. And let's not worry about, you know, the number isn't actually important in terms of what you're going to have to draw. So... Um, you know, they're being, they're using the correct term because they're making paracetamol and you would use four amino phenol to make that paracetamol. But actually when they, what, what they actually want you to do is just appreciate um, what you would do with any amine. Um, and so they sort of simplify it uh, into this form here. So, you know, it could be a distractor, it could be a distraction, it could be confusing, but try, just try to appreciate um, that if they do if they say you can represent, that is that is genuinely making your life a hell of a lot easier. So you don't actually need to know that for anything about 4-aminophenol other than the fact that it's got a nitrogen with a lone pair and that you could and that AQA is allowing you to represent it as RNH2. Okay, so let's just name uh, these examples. Um, we're going to go down the sort of most basic route. Um, so if we look at the first one, the primary amine, um, we've got uh, an ethyl group uh, attached to the nitrogen and there's only one of them. So we're going to be calling that uh, ethylamine. 
Then if we look at the second one, uh, we can see that we've got the ethyl group still, uh, but now uh, one of the other hydrogens has been replaced by a methyl group. And um, this should go in alphabetical order. If we remember way back to introduction of, um, or the introduction to organic chemistry, uh, they go in alphabetical order before the name is prefixes. So it is going to be uh, ethyl, methyl, amine. Okay. And then if we uh, look at the last one, oh, sorry, if we look at the tertiary email, sorry, get, um, email, tertiary amine, uh, we've got three methyl groups. So that's going to be tri, uh, and it's going to be trimethylamine. And then lastly, um, it's not an amines, right? So just to be important, just to sort of make it clear, ammonium salts are not amines, but they, we can make them from amines. They may be the, the, another product in, any, in some reactions that we do. And we would normally, if, if this had been ammonia that we'd reacted, say, with hydrochloric acid, we would be calling it the salt, we would be calling it ammonium chloride. Um, so here we're just actually naming the ammonium by put, by saying um, what alkyl groups are attached to it. So we can see that we have, it's kept it nice and simple for us, we have four methyl groups. So it's going to be tetramethyl, and it's going to be tetramethyl ammonium chloride. So let's see if I can fit that in the box. So uh, tetramethyl ammonium chloride. So you're naming it as you would normally name an ammonium salt, but you're just putting the uh, you're just putting the alkyl groups, the relevant alkyl groups, in front of the name. Okay, so uh, it, this isn't uh, particular to amines. This um, making this comparison between aliphatic versus aromatic, but it just given that um, it was something that was mentioned uh, on a slide earlier, um, it's I think this is a, as good a moment as any to try and to to explain the distinction between that. So nearly all of the chemistry. Uh, that we do at A level is um, aliphatic chemistry. So we're really we're looking at carbon chains um, with different functional groups, whether that's an alcohol, a hydroxyl group, or whether that's an amine, or whether it's a, got halogens, so it's a halogenoalkane or whatever, right? And then there is a topic that we do, which we haven't yet done, um, um, called aromatic chemistry. And in aromatic chemistry, we're, we're essentially seeing how the chemistry has changed or is different, or, or we're, basically we're looking at the, and this is called benzene, and um, then different functional groups can be attached to it and their reactivity might be different. But we'd also be looking at about how we would turn benzene into, say, phenylamine here. So when benzene is treated as a substituent, um, so you know, like when we talk about methyl being a substituent or ethyl being a substituent, uh, whenever benzene is um, considered as a substituent, and it would be uh, in this case on the right here because we would still be focusing on this being an amine, uh, then um, a benzene as a substituent is called phenyl. So anyway, but, but if we're comparing aliphatic and aromatic, we're just simply saying um, that an aromatic is when we, the, there is a benzene group and that is relevant to the chemistry and then uh, where they're just in sort of any sort of um, non-benzene sense, so an alkyl chains or even a cycloalkane or whatever, then we would be um, thinking of that as being aliphatic. It's not, these are not terms that we really need to use. Well, we use the term aromatic because that's how we define that particular topic. When we do benzene, it's called aromatic chemistry. Um, aliphatic, we don't really use at A-level, but you may... It may appear or it may get said or whatever, so it's just to make it clear that nearly everything we've been doing, or everything we've been doing so far, we've been it was been aliphatic, and then there is going to be a separate topic um, which is called aromatic chemistry. Okay, so this is now an opportunity for you to have um, a sort of go at trying to decode um, some names of um, amines. So we've got five here. Um, so I'd like you to pause the video, um, have a pencil and paper or whatever and try and draw these out um i mean it, it, if you're wanting to to strengthen your skills then my suggestion is you try and draw them out in all possible ways so skeletal displayed structural um 
I, when I do my answers, because I have a limited amount of space, I'm going to do a skeletal, but I would like you, ideally what you should be doing to sort of, like I say, promote your abilities or strengthen your abilities is to try and draw them in all, all of the different ways. Okay, so if you pause the video and then we'll have a look at the answers. Okay, so one way to approach um, something like this is to, you know it's an amine, because it's clearly that from the name, uh, and so then is to draw the nitrogen. And then um, think about then what's before the name. So here we've just got butyl, so I would need to have a four carbon uh, chain attached to it. So one, two, three, four. Sorry, that's not the best. And then um, nitrogen always has to have three bonds unless it's that, uh, unless we've got clearly the ammonium um, iron. So um, I've only drawn one thing off that nitrogen so far, which is the butyl group. So I'm going to have to put the H2 in. So ethyl propylamine. So again, if I draw the nitrogen and then I know I've got an ethyl group, one, two. So there's my two carbon chain. And then I've got propyl, one, two, three. And um, I've used up um, two of my three bonds, and uh, I'm going to add the H, and you know I can just do it below. It's fine to do it below like that. So you do add the H um, on the nitrogen itself. You would show the hydrogen, and that's really quite important. Um, and actually, when we come to do another part of the whole of the course, when we do nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR, um, remembering that hydrogen in there is there is going to be important. Um, and if we were, just not that you, that you were asked to do this, but don't ever forget, because it's important to the chemistry that we do have a lone pair. You don't have to draw it on any of these structures, but it's just to remind ourselves that it's there. Okay, so phenylamine. Um, so obviously we've got the uh, nitrogen, um, and then we've got um, what's called a phenyl group. So I'm going to draw a bond, and then we have to remember that basically the phenyl group here is this benzene. So it's a hexagonal shape. So it's six carbons, and then what we have to do, and we'll explain what that really means when we do the topic, is we have to draw this circle, and basically that, that represents um, delocalized electrons, so there are six electrons just whizzing around those uh, six carbons in the hexagonal ring. Uh, we've only added one bond to the nitrogen so far, so we've still got um, two, so I'm going to put two hydrogens. Um, diethylphenylamine, okay. So uh, let's hope I've got uh, the spaces okay here. So I'm going to have my nitrogen and I'm going to just stick my phenyl group on and it makes it easier to do it vertically. Make that a bit small, but it's okay, it works. And then two ethyl groups. So one. Okay, so there we go. So, and then I'm just going to put my lone pair to remind myself. And then lastly, ethyl, methyl, propylamine. So nitrogen. Um, so let's do the propyl first, one, two, three, ethyl, one, two, and then methyl, okay, so, uh, and then put the lone pair, there we go, all right, and then we're supposed to class, um, whether they're primary, secondary, or tertiary, so, um, we obviously couldn't do that until we decided, or we'd actually drawn the compounds, um, so if we look at butylamine, um, the nitrogen has one alkyl group attached to it, so it's primary. And ethylpropylamine has two alkyl groups attached to it, so it's secondary. Phenylamine has the one um, phenyl group or the one benzene ring attached to it, so that's primary. Um, diethylphenylamine has um, a phenyl and two ethyl groups, so that is tertiary. And then ethyl methyl propylamine has an ethyl, a methyl, and a propylamine, hence the name. So that's tertiary as well. So in a sense, actually, another way, not that I, I recommend this, but you can see by how many hydrogens that basically tells us. So ammonia is NH3, primary amine is going to be something NH2, secondary is going to be something NH, and then, you know, so that's one other way of looking at it. So we're going to make the amines next. So this first method is what we're already familiar with um, because we did haloalkanes. Um, so we're going to need ammonia, um, aqueous alcoholic ammonia, uh, refluxing. Um, I wouldn't, don't worry too much about uh, being under pressure. 
um, that's not that's not a condition that you be need to really need to be aware of at A level. We're going to make the um, amine, and then it says all results due to a reaction with the acid produced. So, um, so this is a sort of a, we're going to come back actually to this preparation later. But for the moment, we're just focusing on making our amine. So this is the type of reaction that we would have looked at or thought about uh, when we did haloalkanes. Um, and just to recognise that we're making our primary amine and HBr, but that HBr, um, especially as we've got uh, water present, some water present, it can dissociate to form, you know, um, hydrobromic acid, and so it could be represented as the salt. Um, if it's not, if the question isn't being clear about a preference, then I, either of them is going to be uh, is going to be acceptable. So I wouldn't really worry too much about it on that score. So this is this is this preparation of amine is something that we've. We've done, and in fact, you've drawn multiple questions when you've done homeworks and whatever tests. Lots of mechanism, um, examples of mechanisms to make amines from a haloalkane by reacting a haloalkane with ammonia. Um, we can also um, make them from nitriles. Um, so nitriles were made from haloalkanes. So if you remember when we did haloalkanes, one of the nucleophiles that we could use was a cyanide nucleophile uh, and then we could use that to make a nitrile. Um, we also had nitrile cyanide um, nucleophiles with um, aldehydes and ketones but they made hydroxy nitrile so here we're just focusing on just a, simply a nitrile and then we can convert that uh, CN that nitrile group into an amine group so I, I think I stressed it at the time when we did um, halogenoalkanes and um, we had um, cyanide as a nucleophile is that you're lengthening the carbon chain. So here you can see that we've gone from, uh, sorry, if we'd had our halogen or alkane in the first place, it would have been two carbons. The halogen would have been replaced by the CN. So now we have three carbons, and now we've got uh, an amine with a three carbon alkyne chain attached to it. Uh, you can see our reducing agent is something that we've met before, uh, lithium aluminium hydride. Um, we've met that um, when we did uh, the reduction of aldehydes and ketones. And if you remember when we did that, um, it's incredibly sensitive to water. Um, so the solvent that we use is dry ether. And then this um, bottom one, I have to say, um, is not something, when we talk about nitro compounds, we haven't done those yet. So that is a feature of aromatic chemistry. So nitro compounds are only going to be relevant when we look at the aromatic chemistry. So what you'll see and this is a useful point to sort of point this out now, I guess, um, because it can appear in questions. Um, that the C6H5 um, is uh, the phenyl group. So we would be calling this nitrobenzene though. So we will learn how to make um, that compound. And then when, we, when we've got, uh, when we've got um, nitrobenzene, then what we can do is we can uh, Reflux it with tin and concentrated hydrochloric acid. So that is a new, that is a new um, um, sort of set of reagents or set of yeah set of reagents. Um, we can reduce it to an amine. So this from nitro compounds will also feature an aromatic uh, chemistry, um, but it's just to recognise. And this actually it's a, been a useful to how we show in sort of like a stat normal equation how we would show that phenyl group. So C six H five. So we have replaced. Well, a benzene is C6H6, and for every substituent you stick onto a benzene group, you are, you are um, substituting it for a hydrogen. Or substituting hydrogen for it, sorry. So we're going to go through the reactions of amines. Um, so this is a sort of, it's not the clearest thing in the world, but at least it shows us um, the sorts of things that we're going to be looking at. Um, so we're going to be considering amines as um, bases. Um, because just like with carboxylic acids, yes, that was an organic compound and, you know, thought about its chemistry and all the rest of it. Oh, sorry, he talked about, you know, reactions about making esters and so on. But at the same time, we had to not forget that it was an acid. And so we had to remember just standard acid base reactions. And ditto here with amines, we can still remember that these are going to be bases just like ammonia is. Um, 
So we have to remember those sorts of things. So we can make a salt. Um, you can see here, if we react it with an acid, we're going to make a salt. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, we did feature, or we did have ammonia and primary amines when we did um, acylation. So it was a method for making um, secondary amides. Well, a primary amine is a way of making a secondary amide. Um, ammonia was a way of making a primary amide. Uh, and then we're going to actually look back, as it were, at the halogenoalkanes and think, well, instead of it always being ammonia that we're reacting with a haloalkane, um, what about if it's an actual amine? I mean, the, the, the mechanism, everything's going to be exactly the same, but actually that's how we're going to go about making um, a secondary amine. And we'll talk about this poor yield and further reactions um, when we when we actually get to that point. So very important, uh, amines um, are weak bases. And so you've got to be sensitive to exam questions where um, they are asking you to react um, or they're asking you to write equation or whatever. That there's a reaction between an amine or, or ammonia and an acid. And you've got to remember that all you're simply looking at there is a neutralization reaction. So it's a base because it's a lone it's a proton acceptor and the reason it's a proton acceptor is because it has that lone pair on the nitrogen so that lone pair on the nitrogen is fundamental to the chemistry of amines just like it is fundamental to the chemistry of ammonia um so we just got two um just simple examples sort of illustrating that there so if it'd been ammonia you would have made ammonium salt and here we're making an ammonium salt also so going, you know, um, this is a sort of a slight connection with um, the acids and bases topic. Um, the reason, um, well, the way they act as a base is because they affect the position of equilibrium um, when the H2O dissociates to H plus and OH minus. Um, so that's sort of slightly simplified by saying that the uh, amine reacts with water to form hydroxide ions. But what we're really doing is influencing uh, the relative concentrations of hydroxide and H plus ions. Um, in the you know H two O to H plus and OH minus uh, equilibria, and um, just like any base, they can react with acids, and you're going to make a salt. Um, oh, there's something weird going on there, isn't there? Do you know what? Um, we've already done. Um, that is a bit odd. What have I done there? Why have I done that? So let me just fix that while we're here. Something going on there. So let's just make that Cl minus for the purpose of this. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but notice what the one I really want you to pay attention to, um, just because it's obvious and yet it's not, uh, and that is uh, the one where we're reacting an amine with a carboxylic acid. So um, just just the thing is, it's easy to get confused or to be so bogged down about things like mechanisms or so sort of focused on those sorts of areas that. When you're presented with an amine and a carboxylic acid, you start thinking, oh my God, what, what, what's, what is this? Is a new nucleophilic this or whatever? But simply remember that an amine is a base. A carboxylic acid is an acid, clearly from the name. And so we just simply get a neutralization reaction. So you just have to think about the salt. So um, solubility, um, you know, the bigger the alkyl chain on the amine, um, or the more alkyl chains on the amine, um, the less soluble it is um, uh, but one way to improve the solubility is to actually make it into a salt um, because then you've suddenly got an ion and that means dissolving in water is much much easier and that's how you would make a basic buffer if you want to um, get your amine back and um, so if you have the salt and you want your amine uh, back, then you're just going to add um, a stronger alkali like sodium hydroxide. Uh, the reason that this works is if we think about what our salt is, when we think back to our the acids and bases topic in the physical chemistry side, uh, remember the salt is the conjugate and then the opposite, right? So uh, if we had, uh, if our amine was um, a base, uh, then this uh, our salt is a conjugate acid. So it is able to release H plus ions. Uh, and then we've got our alkali. And so we, yeah, that's how we get our amine back. Now we can compare the strength of um, 
different amines, the strength of the different amines is bases. Um, and so the, the whole reason that they're basic in the first place is they, they have this lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen and that can accept uh, a proton, so the proton acceptor. And we can think of um, whether it's going to be a better or worse proton acceptor, so a stronger or weaker base, um, by considering um, the availability of the lone pair. Now, that phrase, availability of the lone pair, uh, I, I'm going to try and um, sort of explain that a little bit better, but that's how it's described in this specification. So the specification actually refers to the availability of the lone pair. So it's important that we use that because that's what AQA use, but we've got to sort of understand what's meant by that a bit better. So I think um, when, we, when they're, well, not I think, when they're talking about the availability of the lone pair, really what we're making a comparison uh, is between um, how the electron density. So that lone pair could have more or less electron density relative to other amines or, or, or to relative to ammonia. So they will still have the lone pair, but we could we could have done something might have happened and we'll look at uh, we can see here it's affected by the groups attached to the nitrogen so those groups could have made that electron density greater or they could have made it um, not so you know reduced it and so uh, that is going to influence then the availability of the lone pair that's how we're going to phrase it and the more available they are the stronger the base and the less available they are uh, the weaker the base but it's going to, I think, make a little bit more sense when we now look at what we mean by the groups attached on how they can affect that availability of the lone pair. How can they, they can affect the electron density, as it were, of the lone pair. So this links with something that we've considered before, and that's the inductive effect. So that was something that we considered when we did um, carbocations. And so uh, we can have electron pushing groups. That's really what we were looking at when we looked at carbocations. So there can be um, groups attached to the nitrogen that push a little bit more electron density onto the nitrogen, which makes the lone pair more electron dense, which makes means that the uh, lone pair is more available to accept a proton. Or we can have something that was an electron withdrawing group, where essentially it's drawing electron density away from the nitrogen, which means uh, that the lone pair becomes less available. You've got to remember these are relative. These we're talking relatively, so we're talking. Um, when we're comparing different things, they will all have the lone pair, but it's we're just making a comparison about um, how electron dense that lone pair is, and therefore um, that affects how readily or how easily or how available it is to accept a proton. And we can see the evidence of it when we actually, if we actually measured the pHs of different substances that had different groups attached. So when we did carbocations, um, we looked at alkyl groups um, being attached to the positively charged carbon, the carbocation itself. Um, we recognised that those alkyl groups were electron pushing, and so they increase electron density here. So they are increasing electron density on the lone pair of electrons. So I just represent that by that arrow. So that makes it um, more basic compared to not having the alkyl group. So if we were comparing it to ammonia, for example, this primary amine here would have a higher pH, would be more basic than compared than ammonia, because that the difference between them, the alkyl group, has increased the electron density on the nitrogen on that lone pair of electrons, and that's because alkyl groups are electron pushing substituents. And of course, uh, at the beginning, well near the beginning, we would looked at the fact that it could be primary, secondary, tertiary. So uh, if we're considering, uh, you know, electron pushing, um, if we take ammonia as our sort of like our standard against what we're against the things that we're measuring, then when we look at a primary amine, we've got one electron substituent group attached to the nitrogen. Secondary, we've got two and tertiary, we've got three. And so the more electron density that's pushed onto the nitrogen, the more available the lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen are, the stronger the base. So we can see that um, out of uh, tertiary, secondary, primary, and ammonia, the tertiary is going to be the strongest base and ammonia is going to be the weakest. Okay, well, what if our substituent is actually a benzene group? Um, so what if we've got phenylamine, for example? So this, um, it would have been slightly easier to explain this if uh, we had done the aromatic chemistry bit. So um, 
that's something for the future. However, um, the key thing is that um, in that aromatic ring, in that benzene ring, we have uh, delocalized electrons. So um, what's shown here uh, is a pi bond, but that pi bond uh, circles the entire hexagon. And if we were thinking about the shape of the molecule around um, the nitrogen, um, you know, so the, the, this part here, uh, if you think about that shape of the molecule, it's going to be uh, trigonal pyramidal. And so when you, if you actually think about that lone pair and where it is, and then you think about the sort of orientation and the shape, uh, it's not perfect, okay, but um, that lone pair, there's a, that lobe that the or electron orbital that the lone pair is in, um, the, it's almost in line with the delocalized electron. And so it's actually possible that some of that electron density becomes sort of partially delocalized. So it's just withdrawing a little bit of electron density away from the, from the nitrogen. And that, in effect, means that the lone pair is less electron dense which means that we've made it the lone pair less available, and so we have uh, reduced the base strength. So we can have a tertiary, a secondary, a primary amine. We can have ammonia, because we're making that a comparison with ammonia. We can still put that in the order, and then we've got uh, an aromatic amine. So that is where um, the benzene group is attached directly to the nitrogen. That's really, really important, right? The nitrogen has to be attached to the benzene ring. If there's anything in between, then we're not looking at um, an aromatic amine anymore. Um, then the most uh, basic is the tertiary amine and the least basic is the aromatic. And there have been a number of questions that have asked you to, whether that's a six mark question or a multiple choice question, but ha have asked you to uh, either make a comparison or say which is the strongest base or the weakest base or whatever based on um, the different structures that they give you. Okay, so a little exercise here. Um, we're going to, over the next couple of slides, or a few slides, uh, we're going to look at uh, different amines, and I want you to, you're going to pause the video, and you're going to predict which you think of them as the stronger base. But given that, you know, this could be something like a four mark question or a three mark question, um, it's, I don't simply want you to say, oh, that one's stronger. Um, I want you to justify it. Okay, so it might be that you find it a little tricky on this first one, um, but then when you see how um, the, how we give the answer, then I'm hoping that when we come to the next few, um, you'll be able to then make a better attempt. So have a look at the, the two that we've got here. We've got methylamine and diethylamine, and um, pause the video, think about which one is the stronger base, and then try and give a justification for it. Try and justify your answer. Okay, so let's let's class our um, amines. So uh, we've got one alkyl group, and that's electron pushing, and and then on the diethylamine we've got two alkyl groups, that are electron pushing. Um, so we have got a primary and a secondary. Uh, but even just thinking about the electron pushing, um, the diethylamine must be um, the stronger base. Okay, so hopefully that wasn't too difficult. But then we have to justify that. Now, it's important that you're always explicit about things in exam questions and never implicit. So don't ever think, well, that's what I meant. If you're thinking that's what I mean, then that's not good enough, right? Because um, an examiner is not a mind reader. They have to go with literally what you've written. And if we were thinking about a four mark question, we need to be making four points. So saying which is the stronger base is one of those things. And then, well, why? how did you come to decide that? Well, you decided it because you were thinking that there was a secondary uh, amine compared with um, a primary one. Okay, great. So we're making the point that we're recognizing that diethylamine is a secondary amine and methylamine is a primary one. Well, so what? So uh, the consequence, or well, what we know from that is that diethylamine is going to have greater electron density on the nitrogen lone pair or there are two alkyl groups um, that are electron pushing as opposed to one and that means therefore that the lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen are more available in diethylamine compared with methylamine and so there's my written out answer there so maybe 
just pause the video and just read that through and check you're happy with it and if there's anything you're not sure about contact me um, but that's the sort of justification we're going to be using um, when we're looking at the remaining uh, comparative or comparisons that we're going to look at okay so now we're comparing um, propylamine and phenylamine so I want you to like, pause the video have a go which one do you think is going to be the stronger base and then give your justification for that please So the stronger base is uh, propylamine. Um, we are comparing a primary amine with an aromatic amine. Um, so with the primary amine, we've got an electron pushing group attached to the nitrogen, whereas in the aromatic, we've got um, an electron withdrawing group attached to the nitrogen. So that means that the pair alone, lone pair of electrons uh, in propylamine or on the nitrogen and propylamine are going to be more available to accept a proton hence making it a stronger base, the stronger base. Okay, so have a look at uh, this. Decide which of those you think is the stronger base. Um, pause the video, try and think of your justifications. So pause it now. Okay, so the stronger base is phenylmethylamine. So did you get that? Um, so the, the, one of the things is it's important not to be thrown or just to go into autopilot when you see uh, the benzene ring. Um, you'll notice that the benzene ring is not attached directly to the nitrogen in phenylmethylamine. So um, in effect, what is attached to the nitrogen is is in effect an alkyl group, right? Is that CH2. So uh, it is going to be electron pushing. Um, ammonia doesn't have electron pushing or electron withdrawing groups because um, remember, it's like our reference is what we're comparing things to. So we have our electron pushing group in our phenylmethylamine. That's going to increase the electron density um, on the nitrogen. It means the lone pair of electrons is going to be more available to accept a proton. Okay, so this isn't part of the course. Um, it's just something I think is interesting. Um, so you, you may be familiar with the smell of ammonia. It's very um, pungent. It's very, uh, you know, it's something that you... When it, if you accidentally breathe it in of your nostrils, you instantly react to it. Um, so it's not something you should intentionally smell, but you may have smelt it uh, in the past. It's not a very pleasant smell. But as amines get bigger, they actually tend to smell more fishy or they smell of decay. So that 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 smell that you might get with rotting fish, for example, or yeah, so your know, fish is just going, beginning to go off. Um, so that's that amines are responsible for that smell. And um, this is one of the reasons that we pickle fish. Um, so yeah, the fish um, uh, pickling them you know, also slows down or reduces the rate of decay. But at the but the other thing it also does is um, take away the smell, uh, take away that fishy smell, and it does that by protonating the amine, and that is enough to change the smell of the you know of whatever was producing that amine. So just a little little bit of interesting information, hopefully. So we have uh, we've talked about reactions um, and we thought about making amines, but our reactions have really been about bases. Um, and let's not forget that we've got this natural nitrogen with a lone pair. That was the key feature um, as to why it was a base. But it's also therefore going to make it a very good nucleophile because remember a nucleophile is uh, an electron pair donor. So um, if you think about um, making an amine, you're going to react it um, halogen or alkane with ammonia. So there's the um, that mechanism okay that we made so you, you th this isn't the amine that's reacting this is the making the amine but um, we need to go further with this um, so which is why we're also we're, we're putting the precursor the making of the amine into into our um, understanding of the reactions of amines now so sorry I, I, maybe that was a bit confusing so let's just focus on what we've got here we've got our halo alkane we've got ammonia we make our amine, and if we've got, uh, and we we would make our ammonium chloride or ammonium halide um, salt as well. And we, um, when we were doing halogen or alkanes, that's where we'd stop. That was the end of the story. That was the end of the process. Great. Now we get to amines properly. We have to recognise that that isn't necessarily the end of the story. It's going to depend, because essentially there's a problem because the amine that we've made. 
so we made it from reacting the haloalkane with ammonia, the amine that we've produced is itself a nucleophile. So what's there to stop um, the, um, the amine molecule that we've made, or an amine molecule that we've made, now reacting with uh, any um, haloalkane that hasn't yet reacted? Well, if we did that, we would get a secondary amine. So we make the secondary amine, but that secondary amine also still has a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen. So it's still a nucleophile. So what's that to stop react what's to stop that reacting, the secondary amine reacting with any haloalkane that is yet to react? In which case we would make a tertiary amine. And then what can we say about a tertiary amine? Well it's still got a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen. It still can act as a nucleophile. So if there's still halogenoalkane left over or haloalkane left over, what's to stop the tertiary amine reacting with uh, the halogenoalkane? And then if that happens, what we would actually make is that quaternary amine. We would make that ammonium salt, that ionic quaternary amine. So if you simply react a halogenoalkane with ammonia, then re the, in reality what you're going to get is a mixture of products. You're going to get a mixture of primary secondary, tertiary amines, and then the quaternary ammonium ion. And then if you want a particular product, so you wanted the secondary amine, or you wanted the tertiary, or you wanted the primary amine, whichever it is, then you've got to separate um, them, you've got to get it, and you've got to use distillation. So it's a bit of a faff, right? It's, um, and it's, it's a very difficult reaction to control. So just, just illustrating this now with a series of equations. So, um, we made our primary amine, but our primary amine could still react with the haloalkane, and that would now make a secondary amine. Our secondary amine can still react with the haloalkane to make a tertiary amine. And then finally, our um, haloalkane could react with our tertiary amine to make our quaternary ammonium ion. And the mechanism would be the same each time. So I've drawn a mechanism um, to show that the uh, amine, the primary amine that we made a couple of slides ago, ethylamine, can still react with the chloroethane. And now we get diethylamine. And then also at the bottom, uh, just sort of showing that if you've got enough haloalkane, you go from the primary to the secondary to the tertiary to the quaternary ammonium ion. And here's just another representation where we've actually uh, actually used a concrete um, formulae. Um, so you can see how ammonia reacts with our uh, one bromopropane and then our primary amine reacts with our one bromopropane and so on and so on and so on. So our mixture of products shown at the bottom, propylamine, dipropylamine, uh, tripropylamine, and then our uh, tetrapropyl ammonium ion. Okay. Now is there is there anything we can do to influence uh, which product we get more of than say another and to an extent the answer to that is yes and that is um, a recognition of this is important um, for certain types of exam questions so the way we can influence uh, whether we get more of say the primary amine as opposed to, or more of the quaternary ammonium ion is going to be about um, which of the which of the uh, react the original uh, reactants, the haloalkane and ammonia, which of those is uh, in excess or which of those is the limiting reagent, it's the same thing. Um, so if we have the haloalkane as the limiting reagent and we have ammonia in excess, then we're going to get mostly the primary uh, amine because um, there is only so much alkane that can, haloalkane that can react and the chance of a collision is reduced, etc, etc. So the ammonia is massively in excess the amount of amine, primary amine that we make is going to be limited by the amount of haloalkane as well. Uh, if we have the haloalkane in, in excess, um, so we're limiting the amount of ammonia, then we're going to get mostly quaternary. Um, and they, they, it's quite often, you, you, you will have seen actually this in exam questions already, it's just that you wouldn't have really understood the, the emphasis or the point that they were making, and actually it never really mattered probably to what you to what you needed to do for your answer because you just went with the assumption. So what I'm trying to say is if we look at this, um, this is an, an, an actual question at the bottom um, from a, an AQA paper. So for the reaction of 
hydrochloropropane with an excess of ammonia and they put the excess in bold. I've put it in bold, but I put it in bold because they put it in bold, name and outline the mechanism and name the organic product. Now, uh, up to this point, you would have just simply done your nucleophilic substitution reaction and made your primary amine. Um, and that's fine. Um, but now I'm just making the point that the fact they're telling you that it's excess ammonia means you can do that. Now, what if they told you something different? Now you have to appreciate what the consequence of not having excess ammonia might be. So if ammonia was a limiting reagent, they probably wouldn't ask you to do the mechanism because you'd have to do a number of them, but they might ask you um, something about recognizing it isn't simply the primary amine that's made. Now, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing that we're making these quaternary ammonium salts because they are actually uh, important for, or they're used as cationic surfactants, and so they're used in things like fabric softeners and hair conditioners. Um, so a lot of things build, can build up charge. A lot of uh, materials um, can build up charge um, because they rub against each other. You know, you've done static electricity. So if you brush your hair a lot, for example, um, or if you rub towels or whatever, which might be going much, what might be happening in, in the washing machine or the tumble dryer or whatever. So fabric softener is basically a way of uh, removing that charge and it, and it makes them softer and so that's why your hair if you used a conditioner would feel sleeker um, because um, there wouldn't be like so many light charges on your hair which were just repelling each other um, so that so if you look at any of your fabric softeners or hair conditioners you should find um, uh, a quaternary ammonium salt somewhere in the ingredients if you absolutely specifically want a particular amine, uh, and so let's just take a primary amine, um, then, and you want 100%, or you want the ability to make just simply that product, then it's actually better to use a, uh, to make an amine from a nitrile to, you know, react it with a lithium aluminium hydride in dry ether than it is to make an amine from halogen or alkanes. So if you were thinking about synthetic roots and wanted to maximize your yield, and um, part of that was making an amine, primary amine, then it would be much better to go via a nitrile. So with the haloalkane, you've got those further reactions. Um, so you've got a mixture of amines being produced, whereas with nitriles, you're only going to get one single product because it's wherever that CN is, that's where your amine is now going to be. And then just to uh, remind you, um, so when we did acylation, we were thinking very much about acyl chlorides and um, acid anhydrides, and then think about what do they react with. It could be ammonia, it could be a primary amine. But just remember, you can think of it from a slightly different perspective and think about what can my primary amine react with, and it can react with an acyl chloride or an acid anhydride, and, and that would be a way of making an amide. So you can make an amide from an amine if you're reacting it with an acylating agent like an acyl chloride or an acid anhydride. So it's the same reaction that we did with acylation. We're just looking at it. And in the acylation, we looked at it from the perspective of the acylating agent. So the acid, uh, anhy acid, chlor sorry, acid anhydride or acyl chloride. Or you can look at it from the perspective of, well, we're doing amines now. What can we make from amines? We can make an amide if we react our amine with an acyl chloride or acid anhydride. So just just remember that so you know we think of these we do these topics as discrete topics but actually they overlap a great deal because we are going from one one to another that that's what our synthetic roots are we're building up like a tube map of reactions so we can go from one um, type of compound to another via some intermediate via some intermediate compounds and so that's amines um, so if you have any queries or any problems, get in touch and let me know.